for taking time out tonight to, to be with us. Um, the, the president, uh, the president's forum, the provost forum uh, on engaged learning is really an important endeavor here at the college. Um, we want to think deeply about the ways in which we can engage our students in new ways of learning. And it's uh, part of our strategic plan within the division and the college's strategic plan. So um, it's exciting that we uh, are continuing these conversations about how we can um, together uh, engage ourselves in the learning that's so more important to this college. I want to thank the Davis Educational Foundation for their support. And I want to particularly thank the, uh, the uh, Student Engagement Advisory Committee for all their hard work. This uh, topic of social media is a particularly important one. Uh, in the division, we've been talking about how to prepare for Providence College in 2020, and we have a fuzzy idea of, of some of the features of that uh, profile in, in 2020. Um, <clears throat> and clearly, social media is going to be part of uh, our discussions, but I thought maybe I would provoke you a little bit by quoting something that I came across as we were developing materials for that, uh, that discussion. This is from knowledge, the Knowledge Works Foundations, and I don't, um, I don't uh, claim that there's any veracity to this necessarily, but listen to the language that's used by Knowledge Works about social media in the future. Digital natives and technologies of cooperation are combining to create a generation of amplified individuals. These organizational superheroes will remake organizational models through their highly social, collective, improvisational practices and their augmented human capacities. These new models will thrive in a world of social networks, informational proliferation, transparency and saturation, as well as rapid change. Again, I'm not sure uh, whether this uh, comports with what we're gonna hear tonight, but that language suggests to me that there's uh, a brave new world in front of us, and these kinds of conversations, I think, will help us better understand what students' needs are, what faculty needs are, and how the college can move ahead. So thank you very much for participating in this. It is uh, my great pleasure to introduce our featured speaker tonight. Uh, Dr. Ray Junko uh, comes to, let me say that again, Dr. Ray Hunko, uh, I've been working at this all day and I mess it up the first time. Uh, comes to us from Lock Haven University, where he serves as Associate Professor and Director of Disability Services in the Department of Academic Development and Counseling. But as Ray and I discussed when we first began to arrange for his visit at, to PC, that's his day job. We're really here to learn about his hobby. As noted on the college's earlier press release regarding the pro this program, Ray's research focuses on uh, using emerging technologies to help engage and support college students. His current research projects include the first experimental study of the effects of educationally relevant uses of Twitter on student engagement and grades, and an examination of the relationship between Facebook use and grades. He has co-written books on the subject of social media, including Connecting to the Net Generation, What Higher Education Professionals Need to Know About Today's Students, and Using Emerging Technologies to Help Engage Students. In addition to co contributing chapters to several books, Ray is a frequent contributor to academic journals, leads workshops around the country like this one, and provides consultation to several higher education institutions. He's also the author and administrator of Social Media and Higher Education, a blog highlighting his research and offering commentary on technology being used in educationally relevant ways. And you can follow him on, on uh, his blog and, and through his website um, as, as Ray continues to progress with his research. Ray earned his bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of Florida and his master's degree in clinical psychology and his doctorate in counselor education from Penn State. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ray Hunko. Okay, let me make sure this is on. Okay, great. Hi. Is that too loud, maybe? No? All right, they need to crank the bass up to make me sound low. Like the Barry White of social media. Oh, thank you, and you actually did. So I'm going to talk to you tonight for just a short time about social media and student engagement. And then afterwards, we're going to have a panel. And so if you have any questions, please, I, I, um, I want to hear your questions and your comments about the presentation. And we will uh, take those right afterwards for, the, for me and for the panel as well. So social media, what are social media? They are websites and services that allow users to share 
uh, create content, as well as connect with each other. Here on a college campus, the more, most popular social media website is Facebook. Did somebody say something else? So why then study and think about social media in higher ed? Any ideas why? Yes, thank you. Ooh, the, the only way, you know, maybe is the, it's the only way to communicate with students. I will, I will posit, what? Regularly. I will posit two things, two main reasons. One reason is that most students are on social media, and as, I, as we all just said, between 85, depending on the research study and depending on the time of assessment, between 85 and 90% of students are on Facebook, which is the mo most popular social media site for students. Here is a chart from my own research. Can you see those numbers well? This is a search, so time spent searching for, for information online, Facebook, email, talking on a cell phone, and instant messaging. So these are the average number of minutes per day that students reported spending on each of these. So if you'll notice, uh, search is a little over two hours. Some of the students are going, what? Two hours. And Facebook is about an hour and 40 minutes a day. These all add up to about six hours a day. So students are on social media, they use them a lot. And since I talked about cell phones, they also send an average of 97 text messages per day. And it's got a, a bigger standard deviation than that. So, so there's, there's a lot of usage of information and communication technology. So students are on them a lot. Before I move on to, to my second point or the second reason, I'd like to just take a moment and say that we have to be careful about digital inequalities. And digital inequalities are persistent differences in ownership, adoption, and use of technology by people from minority ethnic and racial backgrounds as well as those from lower socioeconomic status. And, and all of the research is very clear that there, there are certainly differences there. So if you think that between 85 to 90 percent of students are on Facebook, what's happening with the 15 to 10 percent who aren't on Facebook? And you can kind of, we, we can I think reliably make some assumptions based on the research about their background characteristics, but I think there are also some other things um, we can think of as well. I am very interested in the construct of engagement and student engagement, and I really, uh, really vibe and flow with Alexander Astin's theory of student engagement. So today, it's generally defined as the psychological and or physical energy that students expend in activities empirically linked to the desired outcomes of a college education. So wh what does that basically mean? Academic and co-curricular engagement. So academic engagement in the classroom, think about what an engaged student looks like. They're participating, they're, they're participating in discussions, they're interacting with the professor, they're talking with, with the professor and other students outside of class. Co-curricular engagement is involvement in groups, involvement in campus activities, uh, leadership roles, things like that. We know from Aston, Aston first proposed this theory about 30 years ago, and so we know from all of the research since then that student engagement is linked to the desired outcomes of a college education. One main one is graduation, so degree attainment, persistence, uh, psychosocial development, maturity, uh, lots of different psychological and psychosocial variables, content mastery, uh, almost every one of the things that we'd like to send our students out of here with have been shown to be related to engagement. So, as you might imagine, a while ago I was interested in social media. They, were, they started to be popular on college campuses. And social media, especially Facebook, intend to be engaging platforms. That's their idea. Of course, the developers are thinking of engagement in a different way. But I thought, well, the platforms are meant to be engaging, and we really want to engage students. Students are on them. Might there be some relationship between the two? There was some early research on Facebook and student engagement, which looked at individual variables 
that were things like uh, contact with close friends or a sense of, of belonging at the institution, and, and those were related to Facebook use. So I wanted to expand that a bit and look at that uh, along a couple of different uh, axes and, and dependent variables. So some of you may have read the, the paper that went around that was my Facebook and engagement paper. Here's the summary slide of the positive and negative predictors of student engagement. You'll notice that time spent on Facebook, these are ranked in order, time spent on Facebook was not the strongest predictor of negative predictor. It also wasn't, uh, it's not equal to viewing photos, it's, it's right under uh, commenting, but it's also stronger, it's not as strong as the positive predictor. So what does this tell me? This tells me that what students do on Facebook is more important in predicting engagement than the time they spent on Facebook. So whether you use Facebook or not is not the key in terms of engagement outcomes. The other thing that was really interesting, at least to me, someone asked me earlier, what, what's been most interesting about your, your research? And I always have to drop this geeky part in here. Uh, from a measurement perspective, that the number of times students checked Facebook was not related to engagement at all. And the reason that was is that the number of times students checked Facebook wasn't strongly related to the time they spent on Facebook. In other words, these seem to be different behaviors. So the example I give in that paper is imagine a student who checks Facebook once a day and stays on for three hours that time versus a student who checks Facebook five times a day and stays on for two minutes each time. So the student who checked five times is on for 10 minutes. The student who checked one time is on for three hours. You see there, there's not much of a relationship there between checking and, and time spent. So these seem to be different behaviors. There seem to be uh, more productive ways to access the technology and then more productive ways to use the technology. This paper you didn't get because it's brand new and it was just published a week and a half ago. And I looked at the relationship between Facebook use and grades using similar variables, time spent on Facebook, what students did on Facebook, as well as Facebook activities. And for grades, I had their overall uh, college GPA that was obtained from the university registrar. So I had act actual grades from the registrar. And I found, I didn't think there would be a relationship between Facebook use and grades. Do you? Yes? No? No relationship? There actually was a negative relationship between Facebook use and grades. But then I looked at that a little bit more and, and dug deeper and found that the real world impact of that was not substantial at all. So, so the findings were statistically significant, but their real world relevance or real world significance was such that you have to spend an inordinate amount of time on Facebook in order for there to be a related drop in GPA that's, um, that's surprising. And so the, the example here is that for every hour and a half or 93 minutes beyond the mean time spent on Facebook, that only related to a 0.12 drop in GPA. And the mean time spent on Facebook was, uh, again, uh, about an hour and 40 minutes. So, so we're talking about, you know, 100 and just a fewer, you know, 100 and some minutes on Facebook. Again, there were results like the engagement paper with some activities, status updates, predicting lower GPAs, while lurking and sharing links was predicted higher GPAs. And I use lurking here because that seems to be the more, um, what, benign of the, of the words that students use for this. M Meg, what do you call it? Creeping, right, right, stalking. My students called it stalking. I actually, I actually gave a presentation about the, uh, the engagement results to my students, and I just changed it to stalking, because all of them call it stalking, and if I would have called it lurking, they would have said, what are you talking about? In the paper, I call it checking up on friends. <laughs> right? So one of my good friends and colleagues is um, 
the, the way I created the surveys is I asked people on Facebook to tell me what they do on Facebook. And so I was able to come up with a list of things and then I shared the list with students and then I shared the list back with my friends on Facebook. And then it, when I went to run the study, I ran it by IRB. The IRB chair is one of my colleagues in psychology. And she said, oh, you can't call it lurking, creeping, stalking. She said, I have no problem with you calling it that from an IRB perspective. But just remember your training in psychology. People are more likely to agree to a statement if it doesn't have a negative connotation. Even though students will say amongst themselves that they stalk, they creep. Do any of them say lurk, students? Do any? No, that's just old people talk for <laughs> creeping and stalking. All right. So what's What's my takeaway from that? My takeaway from that was, well, isn't that interesting? Because the activities that, and I know this is a stretch, but hey, the, the editor wanted me to stretch, that lurking and sharing links are almost, almost based in academic behaviors of collecting and, um, and sharing information. So collecting and disseminating information. While status updates is a more social activity. So kind of in the real world of students are engaged in, yes, I know it's a stretch. Some students are, mm, I know it's a stretch. But, but, but maybe if we can look at the base of the behaviors, what kind of links do you share on Facebook? Let's think about that. If they're not YouTube links. Students? Meg, what do you share on Facebook? Nothing. You only share YouTube things. OK. Just YouTube things. All right. I asked my students, and they, they said, a lot of times they share links of interesting web pages, uh, stories, news stories. Uh, so it was really, it was really, again, it's a stretch. It's not exactly an academic activity, but then again, we weren't encouraging students to use Facebook for class. This was just a study of how students were currently using Facebook. So those of you who are who are psych students or upper level students who have had Research methods already might be thinking, wait a minute, these are correlational studies, and that is correct. What we can say is that there's a relationship between the two. What correlational studies tell us is that where there's smoke, there's fire, but that fire may not be coming from the actual two variables that we're measuring. There could be, it, the relationship could be the other way. It could be that students who uh, tend to spend more time in campus activities and are more involved, just happen to spend more time on Facebook. It could be that students who are worse off academically just happen to uh, post more status updates on Facebook. Or what I suspect is that there are third, fourth, fifth, sixth, et cetera variables that are causing, that are causing the relationship between the two that we have yet measured, we have yet to measure, at least in those two studies. And, and should be evaluating. So that doesn't sound like as much of a bummer as it is, because what we need, or what we needed to do, was to run a controlled study to actually see and manipulate our independent variables to see if there was actually some effect on, um, on outcomes. So we did that with Twitter the microblogging platform. So we had, we had a bunch of sections of first year seminars for pre-health professionals. And what we did was, we had seven sections of those seminars. We randomly assigned four of the seminars to use Twitter, and we randomly assigned three of them to use Ning. How many of you are familiar with Ning? It's basically a brew your own social network. It kind of looks like Facebook, but it's not. And you can kind of develop it into whatever you wanted. We used it to make sure that the students in the control group were getting all of the same information that the students in the Twitter group were getting. Right? So that was our control to make sure that, um, that the groups were equivalent. This is what the experimental design looked like. Nice little cartoon about that basically shows that the control group and the experimental group both received an engagement instrument, the same engagement instrument that was in the Facebook and student engagement paper, which is based on the National Survey of Student Engagement. Uh, then the control group used Ning for the entire semester. The Twitter group used Twitter for the entire semester. And at the very end, we retested them on the engagement instrument, and we collected their not only their class grades, but we collected their overall first semester GPAs. Again, these were first semester students, so all they had was an overall first semester GPA. 
So here's what we did. People asked me to tell them about what I think are some good practices in using social media in the classroom. Here's what we did with Twitter. And I, I would say that these um, are specific examples of the broader categories that I'm going to talk about later. First, we use Twitter as continuity for class discussion. One of, one of the tenets of, of uh, later engagement theorists is that a student will be more engaged when they spend more time on task. Imagine that. You study more, you do better. Right? You think about the material more, you're going to do better. We also used it as a low stress way to ask questions. This was something dating back to one of the first observations I ever made about, about technology and how those technologies are related to things that happen in the real world. And I noticed very early on that if I gave my students uh, a low stress digital way to ask questions, which was via instant messaging, they were much more likely to interact with me and with others in the class and ask questions in class. Once they checked me out and knew that I wasn't going to tear their head off and that it wasn't a stupid question, as many first year students might think. We used Twitter to discuss a common reading. And this was kind of fun, because we had four sections that all discussed the same reading, which was uh, Tracy Kidder's Mountain Beyond Mountains book about Paul Farmer's relief work in Haiti. And, and as they were, because they were pre-health professionals, that was very relevant. We sent out class reminders, things like, hey, don't forget we're doing this, or don't forget we're doing that. We sent reminders about campus events. Hey, by the way, this is happening. Make sure, you know, if you wanted to go see it, to check it out. We sent out support emails at certain times. Like a student would say something like, oh, I'm stressed out. And we would send them a link to a page about, like, here are some easy ways that you can de-stress. Or I'm having trouble studying. And here are some great study tips. Or I'm having trouble focusing. I'm, I'm a big fan of Lifehacker. I don't know if any of you are on Lifehacker. And 43 folders which is a getting things done blog. And so I sent them this, this technique to work for 15 minutes, take a five minute break, do that a few times in the hour. Uh, and, and so things like that. So we were responsive to students from an academic support perspective. We wanted to use it to help students connect with us and with, with each other, because engagement with their peers and engagement with faculty is important. We had them organize a service learning project. That was a requirement of the class for all sections. And so they organized their service learning project via Twitter. Again, uh, students also did this on Ning. And this was my favorite. I, I wanted this to happen. I just didn't know if it was going to happen. So when midterms came around, students were saying, oh, I'm so stressed about chemistry. And so we saw a lot of tweets. And, we said, oh, a few people are stressed about chemistry. Why don't you get a study group together? And they said, yeah, let's get a study group together on the third floor of the library by the blue couches. I did not conduct this research at my institution. I've never been on the third floor of this library, nor have I seen the blue couches, but I know that's where they met. And, and it was neat. It was a snowball effect because the first group of students, they got together and they, they conducted the study group. And then other students heard about it. And they joined in. And it continued throughout the semester. And they would tweet about it. Hey, who's going to the study group this week? Which was like, yay. That was my success. Like, I didn't care about the other outcomes. I was like, yay, they did study groups. These students never do study groups. Um, that's just, you know, I recognize my own bias. So the results. I looked at the difference between their engagement score at the post-test and their engagement score at the pre-test, what do you think I found? Twitter group versus control group. Engagement went up. I wouldn't be talking about it, right, if it went down. I'd be like, that stunk. No, I'd still be talking about it. I have, I have enough negative stuff. It was, it was an interest. It, it was quite a bit of a difference. That, that was a, a five and a half point difference versus a, a 2.3 difference in engagement scale score. So clearly, our Twitter group, their engagement increased throughout the semester. And again, we, we use the different score model. You know, you wonder, why, why do we do that? Because we assume that student engagement, hopefully, is going to increase from day one to week 14, just naturally, if you just leave them alone. And we did see some of that with the control group. Grades, this one was the shocker to me, that there was a significant difference with our Twitter group having an average of 0.5 of a GPA point higher 
than the control group, which when I talked about the Facebook relationship, that wasn't very strong. I would say this is a, a, a moderate to high effect, that I think that if we could do something to increase our student grades by 0.5 of a, of a GPA point on average, we'd probably do it, and this was a pretty efficient way to do that. So the implications of all of this research, or at least the studies that I've talked about tonight, is this. That if you leave students to their own devices, <laughs> get it, devices? That they will use social media in ways that are beneficial and in ways that are detrimental to their academic and engagement outcomes. However, if we can co-opt some of these technologies and use them in educationally relevant ways, then we can really affect their outcomes in, in ways that, that are much bigger than just, you know, if they're using it on their own, which is exactly what we want to do as educators. We want to be engaging them in practices that they can't do on their own or won't do on their own in order to uh, increase academic outcomes. So when I distill these out, and think about effective practices, I think that there are four things, four general categories of things that you want to be doing if you're going to integrate social media into your classes. And one is require use of the social media. That almost seems basic, but it's clear. And I have some preliminary data from a comparative study. We compared using social media in, in a couple different ways in a few classes. And so, so these recommendations come from the research I've shared, but also some data that I, that I have that we're currently, that's cur they're currently under review. Uh, the other one would be to integrate course content into the way that you're using social media. You should have a pedagogical reason, a pedagogically sound reason to use social media. So it's not, hey, we're going to use Facebook. A student earlier said, you know, some students may not want to use Facebook for education. And there's been some research about that. There's some research to show that overwhelmingly students would, would be OK with it. It's faculty who are less OK with it. But it's also in how you phrase the question. If I ask a student, do you want to use Facebook with a professor, what are students going to say? No. But if I say, hey, what do you think about using a Facebook group to talk about the stuff that we talk about in class and then to communicate with other people in the class? How's that sound? Student table? Better? No? Better? This group? Yes? Better. Right? So I think it's important to integrate the technology in a pedagogically sound way that it fits with the goals of the class. As you saw from before, we had some goals for using technology with the class. And those were things we set, we set at the onset of the research. And you know, we didn't let develop. We said, this is how we're going to use it. And we shared that with the students. It's important to share with the students what they should expect about how you will use social media. You need to engage with students on the platform. This could be a stumbling point for some folks who don't have as much experience on social media. If you're unsure about using social media, maybe now is not the right time to integrate it in your courses. Maybe you want to wait a little while until you get a little bit more comfortable with the technology, just like using an in-classroom technology, the smart board. If you're not very comfortable with the smart board and then you start using it, that could not be your best class that day. Use it to, and then the fourth general principle is to use social media to encourage collaborative learning. Sure, we sent students some information in our Twitter study. We've done that in the Facebook study. But it's much more fun to let them go at it on their own and just facilitate a little bit like we do in class, open up class discussion, open up class discussion online, and let them go with it. And that's it. I think I stayed under the 30 minutes, right? People are still awake. <laughs>